you want to learn more about effective management, head over to madsingers.com and sign up for my free management training. Welcome to the Mad Singers Management Podcast from madsingers.com, where entrepreneurs and business managers learn and share. If you like the show, don't forget to leave a review. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Mad Singers Management Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Clayton Atkinson. Welcome, Clayton. Thanks, Mads. Appreciate you having me. So Clayton, you've been around the interwebs of business for a while. Um, but before we jump into all of that, could you give the audience a little bit of an overview of who you are? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Clayton Atkinson. I was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, United States. Um, I went to the University of Missouri for college. Um, and then after college, I worked for a Fortune 500 company, Altria, which owns like Philip Morris and Marlboro Cigarettes. I was a territory sales manager for them for a couple of years. But while I was doing that, I um, bootstrapped a company and ultimately ended up resigning from Altria so that I could be a full-time entrepreneur. Um, well, I think we're going to talk about a few of my businesses and things that I've done today, but I uh, eventually uh, moved to San Juan, Puerto Rico for tax benefits. There's um, some really good tax savings opportunities down here. Um, and then I just really love it. So I love the weather. I love the people. I have a great network here, a bunch of friends. And um, so I've, I've stayed put, but I travel back to forth to, uh, to Missouri quite often and uh, travel around the world quite a bit as well. I really enjoy traveling, but that's where I'm at today. I'm in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Fantastic. Fantastic. So you were in sales management for a couple of years. What, what were some of the key lessons you learned there? I mean, starting out in management is never easy, right? But what, what, what were some of the key things that you picked up from that and learned from that? I mean, a lot, to be honest. I think it was a great job right out of, uh, you know, uh, right out of university. And in a lot of ways, it uh, set me up for a lot of success and, and taught me a lot. It also taught me that, you know, and do you think that these Fortune 500 companies, when you graduate from college, just got it all figured out, that they must have the best systems and the best employees and the best people. And then when you get into the weeds, you start realizing pretty quickly that there's like some levels of incompetence uh, for, some, for some of the people. And then also that, you know, there's a lot of bureaucracy and red tape um, and things that, you know, have to be done for certain legal rules or policies that they've put in place. But in reality, it's like a big time waster. And um, so, yeah, I figured out that, you know, e even the biggest companies in the world, you know, doing billions of dollars of revenue, uh, they, they don't even have it all the way figured out, which, which gave me uh, quite a bit of confidence and uh, desire to go do my own thing. But inside the, the positives there, I mean, I learned a lot about systems. Um, organization. I've always been, a, you know, decently intelligent, but I haven't always been the most organized. I don't think I'm bad, but I don't think I'm great either. And I think that's something I still work on today. And um, it helped teach me organization um, and, and planning, I would say as well. You know, I there I did make a couple of presentations to like my superiors and my superiors, superiors and, you know, how to present. Um, and, and I learned, I've always had a decent ability to connect with people and network and communicate and you know i think i'm in some ways what people would consider to be like a natural salesman you know i connect with people very easily but at altria i was working with um hundreds of retailers usually owners of gas stations and um you know convenience stores and sometimes they had chains of them and sometimes they just had a, a single store but you just you know when you speak business with a lot of people uh you learn a lot and you learn how people think and how they like to be, have uh, data broken down in simplistic ways for them because, you know, not all of these people were college graduates. Um, and yeah, so you learned a lot about how to talk to people and how to communicate and how to make sort of complicated numbers seem simple. Yeah, I love that. I mean, for me, communication is the most frequent thing we engage in as human beings. And I think particularly in any kind of management or entrepreneurial roles, right? Like being able to communicate what's in our heads to the people around us just makes such a huge difference, right? Uh, and that's one of the things I recommend to pretty much all, all the people I work with is, is learning public speaking. Uh, exactly as you said, right? Like when you're just learning to stand up in front of people and learning to actually present yourself, learning to be more concise, because sometimes people will, you know, talk for hours about not a lot, right? So I, I think that's, <laughs> that's uh, true, yes. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, what eventually made you, made you make the jump to entrepreneurship? Like what, what, what was it a particular point in time or what was it just something that built up over time good question i'm trying to remember back we're talking 2016 so we're like was that six years ago now um i don't remember exactly where we were 
as far as like how much I was being paid. So the way it worked was it was me, my cousin and two of my friends. And we were all living um, in the same house. And I was basically paying all the bills with my normal job. And that was always with the intention of creating a company. So I invited people into the house and said, you know, let's, let's start something. Um, and I think it was really just like the traje trajectory more than the growth and how much time I was spending at my regular like nine to five job. And I was like, you know, with how quickly this is growing and how good it's, it's doing, I feel like I need to like crack the whip a little bit more on the people that are around my house uh, because I, I felt like in complete transparency that they weren't working as hard when I wasn't around. And so I thought, man, if we're having this much success right now, like imagine if I was, you know, here eight hours a day and, you know, leading by example. So, um, yeah, I was already, the company was already profitable, which is really nice. It was an arbitrage company. So you can make those profitable pretty quickly, but we were building our own softwares and doing some things to, uh, to be more competitive and make more money on every single sale. And yeah, I think it was around the time where I was making half as much as I was at my normal job, I was like, okay, I can, I can live, I can survive off this. And if the trajectory keeps going the way it's going, then um, it'll be awesome. And, and I was right around the time where I was probably going to be promoted at the company I was at. Um, and for some reason, I wanted to move to Miami too, which was like just a random side story, but they did, they found me a transfer to Miami. And then I turned that down and then they were like, well, you know, we get the idea that you're not super happy where you're at. Maybe we'll give you a promote, like right on the cusp, we'll give me a promotion. And I was like, I don't want to like burn any more bridges. I've already asked for a transfer to Miami and then I rejected it. I'm worried I'm gonna get promoted here. So it just felt like a, a natural time to leave. And actually they did have, a, at that time, they were making some cuts, um, some severance cuts or, or, you know, cutting basically employees and you could apply for severance, which I did, but they rejected me because I was, you know, cheap to keep. I was at the very bottom of the, the poll. Uh, so they didn't, uh, they didn't accept that, which sucked because it would have been like pay for six months. But anyway, yeah. I ended up quitting uh, around the time where, you know, I knew I could get by and I wasn't going to be like struggling too much financially. And uh, it went well. I mean, like the trajectories worked out like we thought. Yeah. That. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I found like, I, I started out in 2014, right? And I've, I've built multiple businesses now, but but I, I definitely find that, that that experience in the corporate world, right? I mean, I was, I was around Xerox and IBM and saw exactly the same as you in the management roles, right? Like the, the, there was definitely, I mean, there's definitely some skills, but there are definitely also some incompetence. And exactly as you said, like the, there was definitely, there was a lot of people who were only there to pick up their paycheck, if you can put, say that politely. Uh, no question. No question. That for me, that was that was the biggest thing. And for, for me, actually, like I was super excited about the concept of management, right? Like I love managing people and I love pushing. And and it was so demoralizing that no one else really cared. Or it felt like a lot of people didn't care, right? They were just like showing up and they were doing the nine to five and then they were home a minute past five or whatever, right? And they're like, hey, well, you know, if no one else cares, <laughs> that makes it difficult. But but it, I, I just saw when I, when I was starting out my stuff like it was such a huge benefit to have that background right and like so many people start a business without having any management experience or without having dealt with people in that way and I, I definitely see such a huge benefit in having that right um, and it just yeah for me it helps get off the ground so much faster right? yeah I think it can I I don't think it's a necessity but exactly like you're saying you know to help you get off the ground faster. Totally agree. And uh, just to be clear, in case this ever uh, goes viral or something, there was a lot of very smart people at Altria as well and some great managers. So it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, you know, everybody, but yeah, there were definitely a couple of people where I was just like, how did you get hired? How are you staying employed? Uh, it was, uh, it was mind boggling. And that's, uh, I think that's the thing when, when you're dealing with a small company, like if you have five or six people, you cannot have someone who just doesn't do anything like you can't. Right, because it's such a big proportion of your money going into it. So, like, you need people who are pulling their weight at, at, to some level, or in some degree at least. Right. Whereas in big companies, a lot of people can kind of hide. One hundred percent. I mean, there was just like not to spend too much time on that, but there was one guy that like our job was to like go around and visit these stores and see what kind of condition they were in and look at inventory and look at pricing and we're and you know uh, marketing like you know signage and things like that. But we were required to like visit these stores once a month. Um, and, and this one guy that had just been working there, I guess, like 10 years, you know, he had his territory and he just like figured out that he didn't have to. I mean, this has happened all across the country with that same company, but basically he stopped going. He would like call and just be like, hey, how's it going? And anyway, they uh, they finally like called him, I guess, 
and he got fired because he hadn't been to stores in like six months. So he was just like chilling at home. But that's like the level, like how big the company got, right? I mean, it's just massive. So like, you know, they basically try to visit every gas station and convenience store and grocery store in, in the US that does a decent amount of volume and trying to monitor all of that, I guess, outside of like putting GPS trackers on the cars or something is uh, difficult. But yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah. People can hide and, and freeload for sure. Definitely. So uh, you you kicked off your your own venture with your friends, and I, lo I love the fact you moved them into a house. That uh, that probably helped a bit. What what was the biggest management challenges getting off the ground for you? Like where where did you feel management wise you had the most difficult time? I think that it's probably the group that I put together a little bit. Like I was a really hard worker. Um, a couple other two were really hard workers, and one guy like the main programmer, like like the classic programmer story. He like wanted to work nights and because he like he slept all day and so he was never on the same schedule as us. So like trying to just like, you know, do business with friends, which he was a friend and is a friend, um, isn't always the easiest. Right. People are like, you know, this is the way I want to live my life. Like I'm getting my work done. But like I didn't really think he was. I thought he was like coding three hours a day, and uh, not doing a ton more. So like trying to like inspire, I guess, like get people really, really motivated and excited and like paint the picture about what this could be or where we, where we can end up if we put in the work. Um, so that, that was a big one. And then also uh, raising capital was, was another uh, big hurdle that we did. We actually went to a, a region's bank and it was very like different business model. Usually banks aren't like super excited to like loan to like arbitrage companies because you don't actually have like inventory. He, you know, there's no like collateral, but somehow we pitched them and they, they gave us a, a big line of credit. So that was really cool too. And that allowed us to expand uh, much more rapidly than if we would have just had to completely bootstrap. And we did for a while, but once we proved the model, we were like, this is just copy and paste. We just need more money. We can, we can generate the sales. And so, uh, yeah, those, those two things are things that I remember sticking out to me is trying to get Joe to work <laughs> and uh, just trying to keep people organized and, and uh, yeah. yeah, I think you'd lead by example, but still sometimes it's, it's hard to motivate even people when, when they're owners of the company, because yeah. we were all yeah. equal owners. It's, it's incredible. Some people are really, really motivated and some people got to be pushed and prodded. And uh, in the case with Joe, he was worth pushing and prodding because he's a brilliant programmer and uh, I don't program. So outside of me, like teaching myself <laughs> and then doing it alongside him, which didn't seem like the smart thing at the time. Yeah. That was a that was a necessity. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense, and I think that's definitely something a lot of people can can learn from, right? I I, I like the fact that you you had people in a house, and I I think uh, I mean there's so much talk about remote work nowadays, but I think one of the things when you start out as a business owner, definitely having some people where you have a lot of close contact, right? Now sometimes a bit friends that can be very difficult, as you said, but but I think number one thing for me and particularly early on is you have to have really, really good relationship with your staff, right? If you are to motivate them and push them and really get, get things going, like you have to build those relationships. Now, you, you don't need to be in the same physical facility, but it definitely doesn't make life more difficult to be so. Yeah, 100% yeah. agree. And um, yeah, yeah. So where, where are you guys at now? So we actually, that business ran for, it, it ran its course basically. It went on for, I'm trying to think, probably like four, four and a half years. Made some mistakes for sure along the way. And I think we're going to talk a bit about that. But uh, we ended up hiring two people in the U.S. And they were doing a good job for or three people. We hired three in the U.S., um, all in St. Louis. And we were in Columbia, Missouri, so a couple hours away. But that's where we were originally from. So we were back in St. Louis quite often. And uh, things were going really, really well for a long time. And then... Um, to be completely transparent, I kind of like stepped away for a large part of it because I thought I had all the systems in place to like let it run on itself. And then I was looking into starting another business. And um, basically the employees made some like major mistakes. Like, I don't know if anybody listening has ever sold on eBay, but you know, you pay per listing to list on eBay. And we had, you know, hundreds of thousands of listings. And if you fall beneath a certain, I can't even remember the names of them anymore, but you know, they, Rate, rate you based on your on delivery times your customer service etc and you know you're guaranteed so many free listings if you meet these metrics and and then you only pay five cents a listing if you meet these metrics but if you fall out of these metrics you know they start costing like 25 cents a listing well anyway the employees on a couple of our different accounts because we had more than one account um was 
like let let them fall into like a bit a small state of disarray and there's not a huge difference between you know uh like where the ratings are you know if you're like 99 and you go to 97 like that's not a huge difference but you know it's five times your cost um and that's just to list the products not necessarily even on sales so very quickly we started hemorrhaging money um and at the same time we started up like an auxiliary uh business where we were buying and selling gift cards so i was buying about $100,000 $100,000 worth of gift cards every single day and selling them to other people in the space. Uh, and those were Amazon purchasing gift cards. So we had another stream of revenue, which was extremely easy because we had a special deal with a uh, gift card supplier. And um, so that was going really good. So now we have like two forms of income. And during that time, like the original, the original business just kind of um, got away from us a little bit and everybody was making enough money where they were getting, I guess, like a bit complacent to be, to be completely, uh, transparent. And during that time too, we also realized that we had hired quite a few uh, virtual assistants in the Philippines. And we got smarter as time went on with that, but figured out that basically some virtual assistants were like, you know, time thieves, basically, you know, saying they were working, but they weren't. We implemented time doctor and caught quite a few. We had like 12 employees in the Philippines. I think we had to fire a few of them for just, you know, doing like nefarious things. Like they have, you know, mouse movers like where they'll just move their screen so it makes you think time time doctor's working but you can actually watch the videos and we found a lot of people doing that so all of a sudden like things that were like really good were kind of not that good um we still had the gift cards rolling but at around the same time as when margins had been going down anyways um the space was getting more and more competitive it was more and more difficult to motivate joe to continue to update our softwares because he's just a very like simple is probably not the right word, but very like chill, simple guy. Like he like wants to live on a farm and just be a subsistence, like potato farmer. He wasn't really motivated. Once he, once he had his like basic needs set, he didn't like want to take it to the next level, the next level. So basically could have probably like looking back in hindsight, find a, found a better, more motivated uh, programmer, but um, still love Joe. And it it was a good time. So basically we, uh, I jumped back into the business, cleaned it up, uh, saved it, you know, saved as much money as I could from the problems that were created. And, um, and we just shut it down. And at that time I was doing a different, like, you know, because I wasn't just like ch- chilling on a beach, I was thinking of other stuff. That's, I was already creating another business. We still had the gift cards, but long story short, we closed it down, um, in like 2018 and I uh, moved on to my next venture. Excellent. Any other management mistakes you felt you made throughout that? Uh, I love talking about the mistakes we make. I, I've, I've made plenty myself, but any, any, yeah, any other I mean, ones? I, I think that like, yes. Um, a big one was like that thing that I explained that, you know, our costs quintupled overnight could have had like, to me, it was like pretty common sense. Like you need to pay attention to these numbers. And I, I thought I had explained that, but I guess what I could have done is built out like more, more SOPs we did have training materials. We did have um, quite a bit in place, but I guess it should have been like, Hey, you know, we, we need a bi-monthly audit of our business and where it stands. And if this number gets anywhere close to this number, we need to have all hands on deck and, and try to try to, you know, reverse the trend. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that would have, I mean, maybe the business would have run for a couple more you know, I don't know, maybe another year or so if, if we wouldn't have just like hemorrhaged tons of money very, very quickly. Um, you know, we had hundreds of thousands of listens, like paying five cents and paying 25 cents, big difference. Um, makes a, so, makes a lot of difference. So yeah, yeah. Like, what, what, what about KPIs? Like, did you guys have some, some good KPIs? Like, did you realize that this happened relatively quickly or did it take you quite a while to realize? It was, um, that's a good question. I think it like, because I, w- I was working hard on, on some other stuff. I was setting up and we can talk about that business too, but I was working with like uh, attorneys and things in South Korea and just doing some like totally different things. Um, I think that the employees figured it out. And I think that they were afraid of like telling us and then they were trying to fix it by the second month and they got close, but they didn't fix it. And then, so we got dinged like for two months. Um, I can't remember to be honest, maybe it was just one, my buddy Ryan, he's always been a very hard worker. He and I, I think we're kind of like the leaders in the whole business. Um, he was the one that called me about it and was like, first of all, we got to fire some people. Second of all, we got a ton of crap going wrong. And um, he jumped in there with me. And then, uh, you know, we, we turned it around largely. And luckily, like, it wasn't so bad that 
you know, we didn't have any profit coming out of the business because we still had the, the gift card thing, which was like a completely separate side of it. But um, it took too long. I'll tell you that it took too long. We should have known sooner for sure. And if we were paying better attention and more uh, had our finger on the pulse, then we would, we would have got, gotten it sooner. We, it was bad management is what it was, if I'm being honest. Yeah. Fair. Fair. What, what about your next venture then? What, uh, what did you jump into and what was that all about? Um, yeah. So the next venture, it wasn't really my idea. A friend of mine, Malik, had an idea to basically do cryptocurrency arbitrage, which a lot of people do, you know, like there's robots that do it, you know, bots do it automatically all the time between exchanges in the US and anywhere that's like open and easy to get accounts. But for whatever reason, uh, South Korea was particularly unique. I believe Japan was similar. And there's a guy named Sam Bankman Fried or Sam Fried Bankman or something. And he's like a billionaire because he did something very similar to what I did, but he did it where, in a place where there were no limits. Basically, South Korea is kind of closed off in some ways from the rest of the world when it comes to banking and opening companies there. And they're very tech forward. So they were early adopters of cryptocurrency and people might've heard about it. There was a thing called the kimchi premium where essentially everybody in South Korea, for whatever reason, was willing to pay more than the rest of the world for the same, for the same coins. So um, when we first started, Malik said, you know, hey, we could, I've done the math. I think we could make 1% a day on any investment we put through there. And I was like, that sounds good. So, uh, but he didn't have the money at the time to kind of get all the, uh, the setup done. So I hired, hired attorneys in um, South Korea, created a business in South Korea. It took, took a lot of time and uh, back and forth and how we were, you know, you had to hire translators. I mean, there was, there was some obstacles there, right? But we set it up and then um, long story short, Right when that happened and we were like doing our first test payments and, you know, with small amounts of money to make sure that it worked um, and we could remit it back from South Korea. So basically we were sending uh, coins from a U.S. exchange. I think we were using Kraken and then we switched to Gemini, sending it to BitHome in South Korea. Then we, as soon as it would hit South Korea exchange, we would sell it immediately because we were just trying to make money off the arbitrage. And then it would hit our bank account the next day. And then we'd remit it to the U.S. and then just do a circle like that. Um and anyway, it got, we got really lucky. It was, it was really fortuitous timing. The kimchi premium started increasing. And I mean, it only, the whole project only lasted a few months. I think we started in like October and it was pretty much all done by February. But yeah, some days, like one day we made 51% of our money. The most you could send back uh, out of the exchange into a bank account per day was 1.8 million. And we didn't have nearly that much capital to begin with, but I raised capital from mostly like friends, dads, like just people that I knew had personal wealth and, um, you know, might have an appetite for, for kind of a risky investment. Cause at the time South Korea was, uh, it's not funny, but South Korea, North Korea, you know, were having a lot of issues. They still do obviously, but North Korea was talking about bombing South Korea all the time. So there were questions like what happens if, you know, Seoul gets bombed, I was like, I don't know, your money might disappear overnight. I'm not sure. It's, this is not a risk-free investment. It also could get locked up in banks. Um, you, you know, there's, there's, some, there's some risk here for sure, but the return's really good. Anyway, I called like 12 people, I think, all 12 invested. Not one person said no, which I thought was crazy. And uh, I, as time went on, I started making deals less and less good because I was like, if everybody's saying yes, it's probably too damn good to be true. So I started taking more of the margin on my side and uh, yeah, so we were arbitraging one day. We made 51%. We sent like a, a million over and, you know, 40 minutes later, it was like a million and a half and investors were happy. And then, uh, then one day, boom, the money's stuck in the South Korean bank. They like send us an email and saying, you know, we're not going to remit your money. We don't know who you are. You've never been to South Korea. We're very concerned that you're doing anything with crypto at this time, because there's a lot of people doing nefarious things, you know, with drug money, human trafficking, we don't know who you are. We'd like you to come to South Korea. So that's what I did. I like bought the next flight, went to uh, Toronto and then flew straight to Seoul and hired a translator. And I was in the bank like 36 hours later. And like, it was crazy. Like I just walked up and said, Hey, you know, I'm Clayton Atchison, and this and that, and my money's locked. And it was two minutes and they were like, all right, your money's unlocked. We just wanted to meet you face to face. Thank you for making the flight over. It was crazy. I was like, what is, what is going on? I felt the uh, really, really lucky at the time and um, almost no investigation done. They just asked me kind of like what I was doing and um, kind of told them. And then, you know, 
the attorney at the time said, you know, try to make it sound like you're not just arbitraging cryptocurrency. Maybe like tell a little white lie and just say, you know, you're also selling products because I was still at that time and saying, you know, that you're you're basically using it as an investment vehicle to buy products. So we kind of like fibbed a little bit just so that it made the banker feel better, but we weren't doing anything illegal. None of it was illegal. Oh, and so anyway, stayed there for three weeks. Um, money kept going through every single day. Investors were stoked. Uh, one investor did pull his money out after it got locked once. That spooked him, but everybody else said, let it ride, baby. <laughs> and uh, so then after three weeks and I was there by myself, I uh, went to the Olympics while I was there. Cause I was only in the bank for like five minutes. Uh, so I got to see Sean white win the gold, which was super cool. Um, and then I flew back after three weeks thinking that I had built a strong enough relationship with the, the bankers. And I was wrong. I was gone for like a week, week later, they locked the money again. So I flew back, spent three more weeks in South Korea. And at that time, it um, almost similar to the other business, like it got where Bitcoin and we were using Ethereum to make the transfers, but everything kind of normalized. The percent went down from one day we made 50, but normally it was around 20% a day down to 10 and then down to five. And when you get around five after transfer fees between the exchanges, remittance fees, et cetera, that's, uh, you know, getting close to where you're breaking even. And by this time we had a lot of money involved and the risk just started to outweigh the reward. So, um, and at the same time, banks started saying, Hey, we don't want to work with you. Like one bank said, Hey, Clayton, we love you personally, but we're getting a lot of pressure from, I guess, what would be like their banking federal reserve or whatever it is over there. And they said, you know, we really, whenever you filed your company, originally you had this thing right here that says cryptocurrency. And we've had to do a review of all the companies that have this. So in hindsight, I should have just said general business management or something, something more obscure. Cause that was like the big thing was the stamp on the, the origination documents of my business. Um, and I went to like five different banks. Another bank did let me open up an account only to close it like a week later. So basically there's like six big banks in South Korea. I just like, it did run its course. There was really no way to do it. I couldn't open another business because they put like a pause on Americans or anybody outside from starting new businesses in Korea for this exact reason. And um, yeah, so we pulled all the money out, returned it to investors. Everybody more than doubled their money. They were stoked. They were so happy. And uh, that was that, that was the end of it. Um, so I flew back to the U S and now all I have is good memories and Happy investors, but no, no more business. No more business. Fair enough. That that does sound interesting, though. That, that's a bit of a riot. A bit of a riot. Yeah. Um. Any management lessons in it, or anything you feel where, you know, any goods or bads? Yeah. Um. I I really was happy with the uh, the law firm that I hired there to help yeah. me. Um, hire translators and business docs like we went kind of more on the more expensive side there and i think it paid off i think they gave me good advice and if they hadn't like had the right per like attorney to tell me hey don't walk in there and just tell them straight up what you're doing kind of have this little white lie as long as you're there like it's fine they want to do business with you they just want a reason that they can say yes and that's kind of the korean culture so don't give them a reason to say no um so in that case i think when you're dealing with like foreign uh, companies, it's probably like very easy to get, I think, kind of scammed and taken advantage of, and you don't know who you're hiring. So in that case, I did quite a bit of research and I hired like, I think what is probably considered a premium firm and it, it yeah. paid off. I think I could have gone much differently if I'd have hired the wrong people. And I always felt very well taken care of. Um, so, so that was good. Um, the only thing I really, I think fumbled maybe was probably shouldn't have left Korea. Like when you're making that much yeah. money, like just yeah. just stay put like just deal with it man <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even uh, I guess. this home or whatever like I, I i probably missed like three days of transfers yeah. which you know there was a good amount of money being made each day I, I you know they told me i could leave they're like you're good now you've been here three weeks you're good they so they told me but then that turned out not to be true um so just be on the ground whenever things are going really really well <laughs> yeah. you know, no, no, no days of vacation and then um yeah. with the origination documents for the business I guess I could have been more savvy with that. You know, I'm from Missouri, I generally think honesty is the best policy. So I was, you know, when I was filing for the business, I just wrote what I was doing. Um, yeah, but, but, but and that's the thing. Like at the time, it wasn't an issue. So it, it's not something people were thinking about, right? But yeah, yeah. Hinds hindsight is uh, 2020. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I think generally now, like, um, you know, I'm, I have businesses down in Puerto Rico. And what I've learned is that generally, I think, the attorneys will tell you just make it as broad as possible so that if you pivot or you change something you know you're still under yeah. the same uh, purview and 
So, so anyway, I think I've gotten a little bit more savvy with, uh, with that. And I did, sorry, I'm rambling a little bit here now, but I did hire an attorney when I first got to Puerto Rico and it, he was ended up being like a bad attorney. I had the hardest time. It took me years to get my, uh, my retainer back after I stopped doing business with him. Awful, awful experience. I love my attorney now. And so if you are in a city or moving to a place that's, and you, and you haven't, you don't have to hire an attorney right away, or you got a little time work on referrals. Like I made a mistake and just hired a crap attorney. And so I've been bit, but, um, but that, in Korea, I that's right. for me, that's for me. The number one thing is network, right? Like I, I, I know people everywhere and, and it's so good being able to, to find people through referrals. And, you know, it doesn't matter if it's lawyers or, you know, in business incorporators or whatever it is. Like if you, if you get recommendations from people, some other people who have used someone that's, that's excellent. Like that's, for, for me, that's such a game changer, right? Yep. Yeah, I learned that the hard way. Um, luckily, yeah. it wasn't too expensive. But yeah, yeah, referrals are the best. Definitely. Right. What are you work, working on right now, Clayton? Um, yeah, so and after that, that was like at the beginning. That kind of ended at the beginning of 2018, uh, around January, February. And um, then I went back to like what I kind of knew. I said, well, hey, I got a decent amount of capital now. And I started doing some uh, investing like pretty actively and lost some money doing that, made some money doing that. It was up and down. I'm not a professional day trader. Thought I would give it a shot. Um, and then I started an, uh, an Amazon private label business. So I've been running that since 2018 and um, had that mostly automated. Um, and recently as of still feels recent, feels like yesterday, but I guess actually it was this past December um, I started working with a company called Carbon6, which is pretty much in the same field. Carbon6 is a software aggregation company, and they buy softwares that help people sell online, uh, mostly on Amazon, but I think they're going to be expanding. And it's not just private label. It's also arbitrage, which obviously I know about, uh, merch, which I know nothing about, and wholesale, which I know uh, uh, enough to be dangerous. So anyway, it was like right already in my purview. And I met the CEO who uh, lives down here in Puerto Rico, but he's originally from Connecticut. And we met through a mutual friend, like a good buddy of mine named Christoph introduced me to Justin. And I wasn't really looking for anything, but um, I got to know Justin. We kind of bonded over baseball and just like had a lot in common. And he said, you know, I'm trying to build this business. It's very new. It's just now like a, a little bit over a year old. And um, he offered me um, some shares, and a little bit of ownership and, a position as director of affiliates and as time went on and this is very common with you know quickly growing small companies my position changed to now i am a community ambassador so i do a lot of uh traveling um and a lot of speaking at events i speak in vegas pretty soon as a keynote speaker which is crazy but also cool and i'm speaking in australia i spoke in um, estonia earlier this year also speaking in uh, new york and and um Tampa. So just traveling a lot and, and like teaching people how to be successful online, but while also promoting the suite of carbon six tools and um, still have my Amazon business on the side. And, and right before that, I was uh, launching another arbitrage business. I feel like I can never get away from arbitrage, which is kind of goofy because, you know, it's everybody knows that eventually, you know, it's not it's not a 20 year business. It's not like a you know, not a long term thing. But the arbitrage between uh, Walmart and Amazon was just too good to be true. Uh, so I was selling on Walmart a lot until about January, February of this year, uh, where my Walmart selling accounts got closed down. But while that was going, the money was really good too. So just all over the place. But now 90% of my time uh, goes to Carbon6. And, uh, and, and yeah, you know, just getting the word out about our tools, basically spreading the word that uh, of what's going on and carbon six has grown really quickly when i came on i think there was like 30 employees and now we're like over 150 so it's growing very fast that's that's cool and i i love like the whole SaaS space right it's it's when you have great tools that are being built and when you have great tools that really make a difference like it's SaaS is such a great business model and it's so nice to work with so that's uh yeah it sounds like a great project and uh, look forward to see what what's in store any management lessons from that? Anything you've learned since joining? Um, yeah, I, like I think that, and also just to take a step back about the uh, the private label business, just if people want to learn some lessons, 
I, I don't know why, like now I've been going to all these events with carbon six and I asked myself like, why wasn't I going to events before? Because you learn so much from going to these events and meeting these people where I just thought I could teach myself completely online. And you like mostly can, to be honest, like you can do a lot, but then you go and you learn these like tricks and tactics that like only people want to share like face to face. Like they don't want to make videos about it. They don't want everybody doing it, but you know, they'll tell you over a beer or a dinner. Um, and, and, you know, you share stuff that you figured out as well. So I, I wish I would have just, I think my Amazon business would have been much more successful, much more quickly and still more successful if I would have uh, networked better. And, yeah. and um, yeah. you know, I'd been to some events in the past for um, eBay stuff and I didn't get a lot of value out of those. So I just thought events were like a waste of time, but that's not true. Like in the Amazon space, there's a ton of value at these events. And if you're like a more mature seller, maybe you won't get a ton of value from every presentation. But if you go to the after party and just start talking shop, there's so much to learn and making those connections. So I wish I'd have done that. I wish I would have networked better for sure. And um, wish I would have used more tools. Like now that I'm promoting all these tools, some of them like have existed since I've been selling and I wasn't using them and they're better than the tools I was using. So like I should have um, AB tested more, experimented more, tested more other tools um, and tactics. Like I found something that worked and then I just stuck with it, but there was other things that could have worked so much better. Um, I also was mostly running this with, um, my, my buddy Ryan, the same one from the other business. And I think we should have hired quicker. Uh, I think we felt kind of like, Oh, last time we got employees, everything went to hell. So we were hesitant, but yeah. you just got to hiring as a skill, just like anything else, um, and training. So we should have hired sooner to scale faster. And, um, and, and network better just basically could have done quite a few things better for sure and now that i am working at carbon six it's kind of like feels like for the first time i'm technically an employee again uh since yeah. like 2016 and with a company with like 150 people you learn that they have to have a lot of like stuff in place and we got a lot long way to go too we need to improve internally but you learn a lot about uh, different time-saving tools and, and organization, you know, with 150 people, you got to like communicate well. And so using uh, stuff like I hadn't used in the past, like Monday for organization and, uh, you know, just understanding the value of like silly stuff that I just wasn't using like loom videos and, and like just, yeah. you know, yeah. better ways to communicate. So just learned a lot more. I think, you know, for my next business, uh, I'm sure I'll start one eventually again, that, I'll just be better prepared, like kind of jumping back into like what appears to be more corporate world this time, like taught me quite a bit, but this one was different, right? Last time I was going around in my territory, meeting people in person, this is SaaS. It's all online. So I learned a lot about um, how to be more efficient, how to communicate better with bigger teams. So I think it came at like a good time in my life uh, to, to set me up. Feels kind of like a, you know, back in, back in college in some ways, I'm learning a lot. Fantastic. Yeah, I love your networking tip. I mean, honestly, I've, I've managed to grow five businesses from networking. So networking was the big thing for me when I was when I was in management corporately. And I, I jumped right into it as I started my own business. And I, I mean, two of my businesses literally built like we didn't have a website for four years, despite being in the online space. Right. Uh, but we mm -hmm. grew so fast because I was just constantly at events and constantly speaking everywhere. And, you know, like we didn't have a need because there was customers knocking us down every day right and, and yeah net networking is just so powerful and and i think i think particular like like there's a lot of these groups where you have to pay a bit of money to be in uh, I, I joined uh, for example Ezra firestone's uh, blue ribbon for a while and some of these events i mean they they they're fairly expensive but it's the whole point is that when I, when when things are expensive to join that means that it's interesting people joining them right and uh, you know yeah when you're making six or seven figures, if you're suddenly sitting next to someone making nine, uh, you know, they might not share all their secrets, but there's a hell of a lot of inspiration to find. And there's a, there's a lot you can learn from just having normal conversations. I mean, it doesn't, it's not even about tactics and tips, but it's just, you know, the whole mindset, the way they look at things and how they operate. It, there's so much to learn, right? Absolutely. And in my experience, honestly, honestly, is that they, they do share stuff. If you yeah. get to know them and, I tell you what, uh, you know, after all these events, there's always a happy hour. <laughs> and so, you know, even always. if you don't drink, um, I do drink, but even if you don't, you just go other people drink and, and if they like you and you're having just an honest conversation and you're not there just to suck knowledge out of everybody and you're sharing and being open as well and uh, yep. vulnerable, you know, 
like, you know, Hey, I'm a seven figure seller. How did you get the nine? That's incredible, man. Like I would love to be there. And you start listening and talking and building that relationship. And yeah, it's not just uh, like the motivation thing. The motivation is great. I, I agree a hundred percent, but yeah, you, every time I go to an event, I learn something new. And and I, I think also the thing is when, when people are doing extremely well, they are doing well on the back of other people. Like people have helped them get to where they are because yeah. most people don't get to nine figures without getting a ton of help. They don't, right? And and most people want to pay that back. Now, if you're some guy sitting down the, at the back of the room and not saying anything, like they're probably not going to talk to you. But if you, as you say, if you actually come up, engage, you show your enthusiasm, you show you want to do things, like people love to help, right? Hundred, yep, hundred percent. Everything you're saying is right. I agree. Excellent. Well, Clayton, that's been an amazing conversation. Super inspiring story from you, and uh, definitely looking forward to see what you guys can do with Carbon Six. But uh, I, I love the whole concept of affiliate. I love the whole concept of um, SaaS. So I'm super, super interested to see what you guys can build out and follow your journey. So thank you very much for joining me today. If people are eager to get hold of you, what's the best place to do so? Um, yeah, I think uh, LinkedIn is a pretty good option. Uh, Clayton Atchison. And, um, you know, I'm happy to give out my email too. It's just Clayton at carbon six.io. I'm always checking my email, uh, but I'm a little bit slower on LinkedIn, but it's kind of nice because then you get to somebody just sends you an email. You're like, who is this person? And I like LinkedIn because yeah. I can, you know, see who they are, put a face to a name. Um, so LinkedIn is really good. But if you don't, if you're not active on LinkedIn, because honestly, I was not until I started at carbon six. Uh, the best way is email. It's Clayton at carbon and then the number six dot IO. Perfect. Clayton. Thank you very much for joining me today, Clayton. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. I had a lot of fun. Excellent. And to the audience, thank you very much for hanging on all the way to the end. We'll be back again next week. Thank you for listening to the Mad Singers Management Podcast. Please leave a review. It means the world to us. You can also learn more about management at madsingers.com.